Yeah, I mean, well, World's Strongest Man, it's in the name, so it's a... Uh, I mean, you know, when you have a goal in Strongman, this is a title that every single Strongman wants to win. Um, and I used to watch Strongman back when I was five, six years old. Jeff Capes, you know, the uh, Sigmasons, uh, Marius Puskunosis, the legends that a lot of people know. And then, obviously, you know, watching kind of Luke as well. Luke's ten years older than me, so he was into the Strongman and the bodybuilding and stuff. And, Seen the World Strongest Man on TV, and I was like, "Yeah, I want to, I want to do that because picking up cars and putting logs above your heads, lifting stones is, it's cool, and not many people can do it. So <laughs> I just thought, you know, why not? So yeah, and like that's the most prestigious sport, uh, title in the sport, and every single strongman adm- aspires to be the World Strongest Man. And you know, when I kind of got into the sport and stuff, I thought, you know, I'm never going to be this, and just thought I'm just going to do this for fun, but. Um, yeah, like I said, watch Luke. I told my family, told my mum and dad, and they were like, hmm, "You want to be a, you want to be a strongman? You want to go lift weights and pick up cars and that? Then do it." So yeah, but anyway, um, it's yeah. So World Strongest Man is was was my dream at about 16, 15, 16 years old. I'll talk about childhood autism uh, later on. But 16, 17 years old, I said to you know a few of my friends, my family, that you know, I want to be the greatest strongman of all time. I want to win World Strongest Man. Luke was competing in Scotland's Strongest Man, and I had gone and watched him, and I was like, oh, my brother's doing this kind of stuff, why can't I? So, yeah, I just said to him, look, that's, I'm going to go on this journey. I'm going to be the world Strongest Man. I'm going to be the first Scottish guy to lift that title above my head. And I had the vision. I visioned it every single day, and it was in 2021. Yeah, 2020, when I won my first title, 2021, that's when I realised, you know, winning world Strongest Man, and it's just, it's unbelievable. I think, you know, People, people understand what World Strongest Man is now. I think 10, 11 years ago when Jeff Capes era was around, he didn't do it. But anybody now knows it's on Channel 5 every single year. It's a Christmas edition. Uh, and just to be able to win the World Strongest Man title and to watch it with your family, that's the kind of thing that lives in your memory, you know, to be able to go and watch it like any other person does. But then to see you on TV winning it is cool. But yeah, that's kind of a wee thing about World Strongest Man. But I think most people in this room I've probably watched Jeff Capes and know the kind of old ones, and then it kind of went off the British team for a while because there wasn't very good British guys, and then from 2017, 2018 onwards, it's kind of floated up as one of the biggest sports in, in the UK now, and maybe even in the world, and like I said, about like, loads of people know about it. So. What does the day in the life of a strongman look like? What's your training? How many calories are you taking in? What's recovery looking like? You told me you ate 10,000 calories per this morning, which is a lot. So. Yeah. So we're a bit bloated today, guys. We were doing a, <laughs> an eating video earlier on, um, so we're bloated more than normal. Um, so a, a day in the life of Tom and myself 
is, is it kind of varies. You know, Tom's a different athlete to me. I'm a different athlete to him. I'm a different person to Tom. And as, like I say, Tom's a different person to me. So for me personally, um, I, I have a huge, huge belief in cold water therapy. Like that is my almost non-negotiable in life. You know, that has, it set me free. It set me free from the, the restraints of, of, of this. Sometimes we're locked up in here and our thoughts can cripple us and all this so forth stuff, all this BS of the world today. Um, and I started doing that back in 2016 um, when we lost our mum. So before we lost mum, um, we were okay strong men. You know, we were doing okay. Um, but since that day when mum passed away, things really started to change. You know, that's when we started to make a plan, becoming a full-time strongman, Tom becoming a full-time strongman. In 2020, uh, we made that a possibility. So then that drastically changed my life. My, my life was then 100% strongman. How do I become the best athlete I can be and hopefully become a better person along that journey? So um, on a daily basis, I get up, try and get the sunrise every morning uh, in the sea. So in the summertime, that can be half four in the morning. In the wintertime, it can be quarter to nine in the morning, depending on, on the, the sunrise. Do that, then we have breakfast. Tom and I eat a lot together. We eat um, a huge amount of food. <laughs> um, so it's, it's generally about eight to 10,000 calories a day um, that, that we eat. So that consists of, so for breakfast, Tom will have 10 eggs because I'm a little guy, I only have eight eggs. <laughs> then on top of that, we'll maybe have some porridge because we're Scottish and we like porridge. Um, and then a couple of hours later, we'd have like a class of a snack. So it'd be a protein shake and some fruit. Then for lunch, it would be our pre-workout meal, which is usually the closer we get to a competition, it's like a cheat, a cheat meal. So that can consist of like a heavy pasta dish, burger, something really easy to consume because we're trying to fuel our bodies. We're not bodybuilders, we're not going on stage, posing, whatever, in a thong. That's only on a Saturday <laughs> night, usually. Um, so we eat a lot of, so we probably eat about a kilo of meat and that consists of predominantly red meat uh, before a competition because the red meat, what red meat does for you it increases your natural testosterone. It gives you a little bit more aggression leading up to the competitions, which we rely on. We need that. Up there. Uh, uh, my, oh, come on, man. Like, that's what we need when we compete. You know, you need to be aggressive. You need to be switched on. So that's, that's kind of what we do. But then on a training basis, Tom and I, it's a full-time job for us. So we train Monday to, Monday to Friday. So Monday will be deadlifts. Tuesday will be pressing. Wednesday will be active recovery. Thursday will be a leg day, Friday will be a, sorry, Thursday's a leg day and then Friday's an event day. The event days take maybe four hours, normal gym sessions is two hours. On top of that, we do a lot of recovery as well. We've got a sauna in the gym, a cold tub in the gym. We speak to a clinical psychologist to look after our mental health as well as the cold water stuff that we do. Um, we see a chiropractor, acupuncture, physio, massage therapist. Um, yeah, so it's a full-time job. You know, that's, that's pretty much a day in the life or a week in the life of a strong man. Um, and then on top of that, we, we have our own business, selling merchandise. We've got Online Strength Academy that uh, Tom and I both run. Um, we have employees, we have social media. We've got a documentary coming out. We're speaking to a Hollywood movie company about our story and bringing that to Hollywood. Um, so it's busy, it's really busy. So we're not just strong men, we're just men working hard. <laughs> Tom, you touched on autism there, and um, you actually said before that autism has been your superpower, and how it's almost helped you to become the best in the world. So I think everyone would be interested to hear what you kind of meant when you said that, and how's that journey been with you until today? Yeah, so obviously, you know, I've been diagnosed with autism at a really young age, and you know, obviously, you know, back in school and childhood and stuff that you get, you know, you get bullied, you get labelled different things, you you feel left out of things, you can't mix with people, you can't mix with different people out from your family and your support group. So when I was about, uh, when I started Strawman about maybe 18, 19 years old, obviously it was a new sport for myself and I really struggled with the mental side of things in Strawman. Like physically, when I started Strawman at 18, 19 years old, I was bigger than, you know, I was six foot five, six foot six, 130 kilograms. 
the weights was fine, but it was the interviews. I had to get Luke to sit in the room with me and do all the interviews with me. The MCs would announce my name. I'd see all the crowd, and I would just bottle. I would just run back into the changing rooms and not want to compete. And for myself, and then, you know, seeing 500, 600 people staring at you and thinking this in my head, like this, I'm different. Why can't I be like my brother? Why can't I be like these other athletes and be able to compete in front of these people? And they're all going to look at me and laugh. I think in my head they're going to laugh at me. They're going to think, ah, oh, he's rubbish. He's not going to be this. He's not going to be that. And uh, it was, you know, it's very hard to take. Although they didn't say that from in my head, that was what was going through my head and going through my mind. And you know, I went back. I was going home. I was trying to talk to my family, my wife, and I said, look, I, I don't know what to do because um, every, everything I'd done, I just quit because when things got hard and I got uncomfortable, I would just be like, I don't want to do that. It was the same with football. It was the same with anything. So. About 18, 19, maybe 19, no, uh, just before I won World Strongest Man in 2021, I was speaking to, as Luke said, a psychologist, and uh, she kind of just tapped into my brain where I never ever thought I could tap into. She started, I started learning about tun uh, tunnel vision, kind of, you know, not fo focusing purely on myself and focusing on uh, how to kind of, Make my how how to concentrate on stuff in the gym. So like I could go into dark thoughts. I could come out of dark thoughts. I could go into happy thoughts. I could come out of happy thoughts. And she called it the championship mindset. So it was a risk for myself because when I joined it, it was about four or five months before World Strongest Man, and Luke had already talked to her. So I was just like, you know, it's not going to make me a bit worse athlete. So why don't I do it? So within two or three months talking to her, I just started realizing autism is powerful. Like very, very, very powerful. It's not a label. I'm one of the strongest guys in the world. I've got this thing I wrote on Facebook before I won World Strongest Man in 2021, one month before saying, Tom Stokeman, World Strongest Man. And that's because of this psychology. And that's because I ended up saying, just randomly, uh, autism's a superpower. And when I put 100% into something, when I'm visually looking at something and saying, I'm going to be World Strongest Man, I'll wake up every single day and feel invincible. I'll feel like nobody in the world can touch me, nothing will get me down. Just like, you know, you watch the superheroes on TV, Batman, Superman, they can lift cars, they can do all that kind of crazy stuff. And for me, that's how I was feeling from 2021, was like, you know, I've got this autism, but I can beat 30 other guys that haven't got this disability, this whatever you want to call it, this label. So I'm going to prove to people that having autism isn't a label, isn't I think you can, you know, lock yourself in your room and you're not going to have a successful life. It's a thing you can go out, you can put your chest out and you can uh, be great, be great at what you do. And I want to be, you know, I want to be good at strongman, but I just wanted to get so many people with autism that right kind of, you know, being able to speak out about it. Like, and since I've said it's a super party, the amount of people that have kind of opened up, the amount of people that, you know, come to my gym, the amount of people that say, I want to be the next Tom Stokeman. You know, that's, winning World Strongest Man's good. Winning World Strongest Man twice is good, but for someone to say that they want to be the next Tom Stoughton, or a 12-year-old coming up to me, 11-year-old coming up to me, parents coming up to me and saying, you've changed my child's life. My child now talks, my child now goes to their friend's house, my child's now, uh, you know, going to school. My, my fiance is now a boss at, at her job. It's unbelievable what this work can do. Instead of labeling it as a, you know, a label, as a disability, as whatever you want to call it, so I just wanted to put a spin on it and say, you know, because I watched these superheroes when I was younger, I was like, you know, I am a superhero. People with autism wake up every single day and achieve more and can achieve just as much in life as somebody without autism. And that's how I wanted to kind of put the spin on it. And from going forward in schools, you know, in talks, anywhere in life, that's how I want autism to be remembered. I like sort of mental strength, actually. What you guys do is look after your mental strength. And day to day, you're not just looking after your physical health, but also your mental health. So yeah, obviously I'm a strong man. I go to the gym a lot of the time and that helps me. But uh, in recent years, um, I've been exploring a little bit more of like a spiritual side of things. So, you know, I think we all have a connection. Everyone in this room, we're all connected. You know, we have to be because we feel, we have emotions. If someone's sad, usually we become sad. If someone's happy, we become happy. So in my head and stuff, not just my head, but what I read and listen to and so forth, is that we all have this connection. Mother Nature has a connection. We're connected to Mother Nature. If we, if we feel sad, a lot of the time we just go for a walk in the forest or the woods or down the beach or do whatever. So for me, this, this is something I really, really, truly believe. Um, so when I go for a swim in the morning, I go for a walk along the beach. I walk in my bare, foot, bare feet and my speedos, walking along the beach, and I feel absolutely
amazing. Like, absolutely insane. So that must mean something. It's not just me feeling something. Surely, if other people do that, you're going to feel something as well. What we live in today is a concrete jungle, and that's, that's okay. But what can we do to feel better? There's trees here, there's parks here. I'm a big hippie at heart. When I walk through the forest or the woods in Scotland, I'm touching the bark. I did that in London today. We were filming with a guy. He said, did you just touch that tree? I said, yes, I touched that tree. Why not? <laughs> But that can make you feel better. You're connected as living things. We're all living things here. It's, there's so much that we don't know and we're so closed off from things that we don't know. People think I'm crazy because I go into the sea at four o'clock in the morning in the summer. I'm thinking, no, you're fucking crazy because you don't do it. Like, because it makes me feel amazing, so why wouldn't it make you feel amazing? It doesn't cost anything. Going for a walk in the woods, it's touching a tree, smelling a flower, like these things are really, really special and it's beautiful that we can do that. So as soon as we start to take things for granted, you know, seeing a flower boom, blossom, it's beautiful. Our mum passed away in 2000, 2016. Our dad plants 7,000 sunflowers in his garden every summer and that is my mum. That's our mum there every summer. We get to experience that. I get to see her, I get to connect with her. So just because she's not here in the physical doesn't mean she's not here in a spiritual way. I'm not religious in that sense. I'm just spiritual. I'm trying to find different ways of connecting. Um, but yeah, training is pretty cool as well because it makes you feel good. <laughs> if that's not your bag, go to the gym, go for a walk, eat well. Um, but if not, I'll see you in the forest, in the parks, <laughs> smelling trees. <laughs> Sorry. I got so what do we think in terms of the role that male stereotypes or stigma still play around mental health in today's society that stop men from getting the help they need? I've got some strong opinions on that. Um, she, it's, it's awful. Like, it's, it's disgusting how, um, I don't know, how much men struggle. It's not just men, it's, it's people. We all struggle. We, we all do. Um, but young men in, in, in the world today, I'm not so young anymore, I'm 40 next year or so, I don't think I come into that category. But young men, we of, often get tarnished at the moment as there's a lot of like, from the media, it's like toxic male, toxic, toxic, toxic. There's a lot of negativity towards men, especially. And we're not bad people. Like men, we fuck up. Yeah, we do fuck up, we mess up sometimes, but it doesn't, we don't deserve to be taking our own lives, committing suicide, cutting ourselves, hurting ourselves. Like, like you said, you know, saying you're a bad person, you're a bad person, you're a bad... We're not bad people, we just make mistakes and, and that's, that's okay. Some mistakes are, are really bad, you know, we do f up. Men are sometimes bigger f than women, uh, guarantee. My wife would testify to that. Um, but we're not bad people and it's just, it's guiding them. It's like, you know, having these ambassadors, having this open talks, being more open with people. You know, we can all talk, we're, like I said before, we're all connected. You know, men, women, and everything in between. We're more like each other than we are different. So it doesn't matter what we are, what our genders are, what our sexes are, whatever it is you want to call yourself, we're still very much the same. We're very much equal. So why can't we just be equal? Why can't I just sit here and say, you know what, I'm really missing my mum today. It was her anniversary two days ago, so why can't I just say that and get emotional and be okay? Do you know what I mean? That's, that's something that we should be able to do as men, as women and everything else. That's something that I really believe. And the more we open up as men, as women, the more we can be emotional. If we're feeling emotional, let it out. There's no point holding it in because it's like a bucket. It'll just keep coming up, keep coming up, and then it'll just explode. You'll try and do something insane, like taking your own life in this in mad world, it's mad but it's beautiful. Go back, flower, smell a flower, touch a tree, walk in the sand, go to the cold water, go to the gym, eat amazing food. How amazing does it feel when you eat amazing food? It's fucking amazing, oh my God, this is amazing. Go and do that. Do you know, I, I, when you find someone that you love, oh my God, I love you so much. The next day you don't, okay, that's fine. That's just maybe last, it doesn't matter. You're still having these mad emotions and mad connections. So why not just have that? Why not just experience that? I'm okay, whenever I go to this, the, the sea in the morning, I cry, I miss my mum so much 
every day. She's, this is the tattoos of my family. My family mean everything to me. But you guys are my family because we're all a community. We're all here. So that's, that's what I think. I think it's so bad what the, the, the mainstream is trying to do. You know, they have a, it's like, oh, you're not good enough. Buy this, do this, be this. We can just be simple and be okay with that. We don't have to, <sighs> I told you I have opinions on this. Um, we don't have to be the best at everything. We don't, Tom and I, we don't have to be the world's strongest brothers. We don't have to be the best consultant in the world. Just be happy with what you do. Keep it simple. Go eat some nice food and enjoy it. Just smell the roses like they say. That's what I do. And, it stops me from blowing my head off sometimes because sometimes at the end of the day when things have been messy, that's all I want to do. But then I know I've got a responsibility to this big The guys that work with us, my wife, my mum who's looking down on us, still connected to us. I've got that responsibility. I know it's going to be okay in the morning because I get to wake up, I get to see a sunrise, I get to go to the cold water. Wow, this is amazing. Oh my God, it's so cold. I'm happy for that next nine, 10 hours, and then I feel like blowing my head off again, and then I start again. That's, I don't know, yeah, so, whatever. Sorry. I don't know if I answered, I don't know, I, was, I got a bit. So I, I saw a quote the other day, and it described your friendship group and support network, like a tree. The idea is that you have leads in your life, so these are people who provide shade, provide color, you also have branches. So these people who will be there throughout the seasons, and if they're with you for a long time, they can grow strong. If you get too far to the end of the branch, it might break. And then in life, you've got the roots. These are people that are always there for you no matter what, who hold you to the fire, and will be there throughout your life. Who are the roots of your life? Who are those people who really hold you to the fire and are always there for you, and, and what those people mean to you? If you don't say me, Tom, I'm <laughs> really offended. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, being the autistic kid, I think number one in my head is my mum. I think my mum was my biggest supporter. She cared for me. She, you know, sacrificed. And we had five siblings, so she sacrificed all their, their time, Luke's time, my brother's time, sister, to make sure I was all right. So, yeah, she, I mean, you know, when you talk about roots, when you talk about family, my mum was the top of the tree because... Yeah, she was unbelievable. Like, I could open up. That was the only person that understood me as an autistic child, as her child, as a person going through life, you know, going through puberty, going through high school, going through workplace. She was the only person I could go to and talk about how I was feeling. You know, if I took meltdown, she would understand it all. If I acted up in public, she would understand it. But she would never, ever, ever question me. She would always support me, whatever I wanted to do. You know, when I was... A wee boy, I wanted to be a professional footballer. That was my dream in my whole life was when I had a football at my foot, feet when I was younger, I felt the happiest kid in the world. And I told her, I said, I'm going to be a professional footballer. She said, do what you want. But it's crazy. But yeah, she never, ever said, you're not going to be that. So yeah, she was, and still is to this day. I know we've got tattoos of sunflowers. I've got you know angels on my thing. I, talk, I point to heaven when I do competitions. She is and always will be my number one route because you know she made me the person I am today and she always gave me belief, gave me hope. You know, I got told by a lot of people that I would never leave my mum and dad's house, I would never get a wife, I wouldn't be able to, you know, move out and do things myself and I proved every single person wrong and that's because of her. And then, you know, obviously my brother Luke, you know, I mean my family are really close, but myself and Luke since you know, since doing Strawman, um I have took a lot of kind of I've, I've learned a lot from Luke, you know, as kind of doing interviews, how to make myself a better person physically, how to make a, be my, a better person mentally. And uh, he's kind of been a mentor to me, you know, I've kind of, Luke's been my best friend since, you know, obviously my whole life, but since maybe 16, 17 years old, since I first walked foot into the gym, that's when, you know, obviously Luke being 10 years older than myself when I'm younger, you know, when you're a 10 year old kid and he's 20 years old, you're not going to have that same relationship. So. We were never close, so when I stepped foot into the gym and when Luke said to me, you know, I want to help improve your life, I want to take you to the gym and see what you can be. Because before that I was, you know, locked myself in my room, I didn't want to be here, I didn't want to do any of that. So to have a brother that you're not very close to, to say, you know, I want to try and change your life. And I wanted to follow in his footsteps. I've seen how much it helped Luke, I've seen how much it helped 
him with his behaviour, how he got closer to the family. I just wanted to be like, I want to be like Luke. And then, you know, watched him at competitions, watched him just blossom as a person. And I was just like, this is unbelievable to see how going to the gym, lifting weights, turns you into this person. And I was like, I want to be that. So yeah, Luke just from 16 years old, 17, 18, 19 years old, took me under my wing and he was basically my PT, he was my chef, he was, <laughs> he was everything to myself and, you know, between him and between my mum, those two people helped me become who, who I am today and, you know, like I said, Luke would sit in interviews with me, I'd never be able to talk in front of these, you guys five, six years ago, I, would, I wouldn't even be able to talk in front of one person when I first started Strongman, Luke had to come into the room with me, he sacrificed a lot of his prep time as a strongman to help me get mentally better as a strongman as well. So it was, you know, very nice to have that because obviously strongman's such an individual sport and Luke's got his worries to do, deal about, he's got his training to do, I've got mine, but he always sacrificed his own training, his own achievements to help me and, you know, it's unbelievable because, like I said, I wanted to quit strongman when I was 18, 19 years old because I couldn't handle the interviews, but to have Luke there to kind of, you know, let me breathe, let him do all the talking, let him just be that person that kind of took all the pressure off me and was an unbelievable thing. So yeah, that's a massive thing. And then to be able to then own a business with him, to travel the world and do strongman together. It's, you know, it's any, it's any brother's dream to be able to, you know, when you're, you know, when you're born and you're like, you know, what do you want to do? And, you know, you say in 20, 30 years time, that, you know, your two brothers are going to be the world's strongest men and you're going to be competing together. It's, it's a dream and it, it's now, it's a reality and it's unbelievable to be able to do that with Luke and to have a business, to do strongman, to travel the world together, to do literally every single thing together. And then probably my last person, my wife, um, I met my wife when I was 17, 17 years old. And, you know, this is one of my biggest achievements because, again, you know, a lot of people said to me, you're gonna be the last person to leave your mom and dad's house. You're never gonna get a wife. You're never gonna get a job. You're never gonna do anything. I think I was one of the second or third people to move out of my mom and dad's house. I got married at 21 years old. Just my mom saw my wedding before she passed away. And that's the thing she said to me. She said she wanted me to be happy. She didn't care about straw man. She didn't care about titles. She just said, I want you to find your worth living on this earth. And I want you to get a wife. And I want you to treat her with respect. And I want you to get a house and be able to look after her. And you know, that's what I did, and you know, I owe a lot. I owe a lot to Shanae, my wife. You know, 21 years old, I married her. 18, I met her. I, you know, I was too scared to tell her that I was this autistic kid because she was outgoing. She, she was just a very, very confident person. But you know, she, she'd never ever judged me. She, I literally sacrificed her whole life. She sacrificed her job. She sacrificed everything to make sure that my strongman career was number one in both our lives. And yeah, she's been by my side ever since, and she's took the role of my mum as a support person, as a wife, and she comes to every single competition with me. She's not missed a competition for the last 10 years, and you know, and it's been, it's amazing to have that kind of three branches, and uh, three roots in your life that kind of are actually there, and want you to succeed, and want you to be the best version of yourself. Luke, how would you, how is it to hear that from Tom? How do you talk about your relationship and what is, what is it like from your point of view? Uh, <coughs> oh, get, I got a little bit emotional listening to Tom when he speaks. That's the nicest thing he's ever said. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was really nice. Um, you know, <sighs> oh, sorry. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm just in a big emotional mess sometimes. Um, that really touched me. Um, but to see Tom, um, like, Tom doesn't remember sometimes how, uh, how tough it was for Tom when he was younger. Um, and when he says it was a real struggle for him to speak to people, um, it was, you know, it was, it was a real big thing and he wouldn't leave the room, he wouldn't leave his, our, our house. Um, until he was like 14, 15. Um, and to see him, you know, work alongside L'Oreal and do this amazing campaign, um, that's like, that's my mum up there, that's our mum looking down, just beaming, man. That's like f***ing wild to see Tom, this little autistic kid from the Highlands of Scotland, becoming the world's strongest man. But, I mean, we talk about strength, we talk, 
you know, what is the world's strongest man. Lifting the heaviest weights isn't the world's strongest man. It's, it's overcoming adversity, it's overcoming things that set you back or that should hold you back and you shouldn't amount to anything. But to me, I just love him, man. I just like, this guy that sat here is, is, is like so humble. He doesn't realize how, how special he is. And that's the, that's the true testament to Tom. He's a very, very unique person. Uh, and I mean that in the most respectful way because he is, just enormous in stature, enormous in heart, and he's the friendliest, loving person that you'd ever meet. And to see people come up to our little town in Invergordon and families come up and say, like little kids that are autistic and can't speak, like look up to Tom and just smile. That's all you need, you know, you don't need to have words, you don't need to have a vocabulary to, to, to kind of put out your feelings. Like Tom gives, kids on the spectrum or whatever the terminology is, people with additional needs or with, with, with no way out, Tom gives those people hope. And that is, that's the biggest title I think Tom will ever have, is, is that inspiration that he gives to so many people. Um, and it's just a pure pleasure to be here. I'm so happy that I get to hear Tom say nice stuff about me, which um, <laughs> makes me feel really embarrassed and emotional, um, but it's really nice. And it's a huge honor to, to be here with you guys as well, sharing, sharing your story. It's, it's so touching and um, yeah, just, I'm just an emotional mess just now, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use you as inspiration. <laughs> 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 <laughs>